So up next we have uh, Georgios Constantopoulos uh, from Loom Network. He's doing some great research there, and he'll be, you know, uh, giving us a bit of insight into uh, plasma cache. So let's have a round of applause for Georgios. So thank you for coming. I'll talk to you about plasma, uh, scalability, solution, and among other things, which has been hyped a lot in Ethereum land. Uh, so let's dive into it. So yeah, basically currently everybody's talking about uh, UX and whatever, but the um, bear market allows us to do that. When the next um, scalability problems arrive, we need to be ready for this because this is a hard time. And so um, let's start with some fundamentals on side chains. We have one chain, we have another chain, the sending and the destination chain, whatever you want to call them. And uh, basically, usually the process that happens for this is that you lock some UTXO that you have in an escrow. Um, then the other chain, this could be whatever chain you like, creates the new uh, asset based on the asset that was just locked. Then in this chain, you can just do whatever you want to transact with the coin. And then when you want to withdraw, like when you want to take your funds out, you just burn the funds that you had, and then you go to the other chain and you say, please unlock my Bitcoin. Here is the, um, the burn transaction that I made. And uh, this is called the two-way peg. You can also have a federated peg, like Bitcoin's, uh, Bitcoin Liquid, which is essentially a multi-sig that locks and unlocks funds. Um, different approach, almost the same security model. Um, but there is a problem with this. Um, problem, well, for scalability, there is a problem with this in the sense that um, after you have locked your funds, this should be, say, S, yes, uh, after you have locked your funds, um, if the sidechain consensus does not allow you to burn your funds or the federation multisig um, basically does not give you a SIG to, unlo to unlock your funds, um, you're done. You cannot take your funds out. And then if you want to do scalability, um, I will claim that usually the sidechain will be less secure. It will not use a full hash rate, uh, high hash rate proof of work algorithm. So um, it may be like some depots or some like low hash rate, something that can be attacked basically. So let's try to do better. And uh, the problem is that basically, yeah, you have like the sidechain consensus governing the security of funds. Uh, so we have Plasma. Uh, notice how I have the Ethereum logo here because we don't know yet if this can be done in Bitcoin, maybe. And basically the process is that each Plasma block, you take its Merkle root and you commit it back to the original chain. And uh, this is done by basically some untrusted database manager, which we call the operator, who is basically assigned with uh, gathering all transactions, putting in the plasma block, committing it, and so on. But because the operator is untrusted, um, you need to add some sort of more uh, additional things. So in our plasma construction, we say that it's non-custodial in the sense that you're as secure as your parent chain consensus is, but you always you need to introduce an exit game. And this exit game uh, involves the process by which you take your funds out, basically. So how does this work? Um, basically, instead of having an instant withdrawal, you allow for a dispute period. So you start an exit, you wait some time period, then you finalize the exit and you withdraw. This is the happy case, so this happens always. You can alternatively introduce a method by which you know, some other party sees your exit, it validates it, it checks that it's okay, and they buy it at some discount, and you get your funds out instantly, but that's an additional protocol on top. Um, in the unhappy case, when you're trying to cheat, basically somebody can just come in and challenge you and you can, can no longer get your funds out. But the thing is that here you're trying to cheat, so you shouldn't be able to get your funds out. Um, in, this version of Plasma that we're working on, uh, it's called Plasma Cash because it's a UTXO-based plasma chain where each coin is a non-fungible token, so it's like cash, it's literally like you cannot tear it apart. So it's like unique, it has a serial number, and the UTXO format is like one input, one output, so it just sign the new owner of the UTXO over. Uh, it uses a data structure called the sparse Merkle tree, which is an ordered Merkle tree which allows you to have both inclusion and exclusion proofs. Um, whenever you deposit the coin, yeah, you receive the serial number. And it has this requirement that uh, whenever you make a transaction, you reference a parent transaction. And if at any point you equivocate, if you sign two messages for the same coin with the same parent, you, it's a double spend and you can be challenged for it. And whenever you exit, you just say, I got the coin at this block. And optionally, in some um, variants, you need to also provide the parent block. And so I will go over like the basic transaction format and like how exits and challenges work. 
So let's go through an example. Like first, let's say I have five Ether on the Plasma contract. So I have like literally five Ether in my account. I go to the Plasma contract, deposit. Um, five, and I get a five Ether NFT. So it's like a coin with a serial number on the Plasma chain. And the coin I get it from nowhere. When I want to transfer it to Bob, let's say, um, I send Bob my coin plus an inclusion proof at block one in this example. And Bob checks that it was included in block one and block two, everyone's happy. And block one and block two, the, this check is made after the operator has committed the Merkle block root to the parent chain. And now let's say that like block three happens, like nothing, like some other coin moves, so let's say like some other Charlie's coins move, but like we do not care about it. At block four, um, maybe Bob sends the coin to Charlie, and so Charlie not only must verify the UTXO history for block one and two, he must also verify that there was no transaction in block three. Because if there was a transaction in block three, this would have been a double spend, and if Charlie is an honest party, he wants to reject any double spend coins. We will see in the example after how Charlie may want to accept the coin if he's trying to cheat, but we'll see how that can be uh, countered. And whenever Charlie wants to exit, he will say, I got it at, at block four and at block two, and I'm done. Like, I wait for seven days or whatever amount of time you want to wait, and you can say, I can finalize my exit. And the process is like very straightforward in Plasma Cash. It's, I have a coin. In the happy case, I exit it. It goes to the transitioning the second phase. After I wait seven days, I can transition to the next phase. The F means finalize exit, the E means exit. And then after I have finalized the exit, I can withdraw it. Um, in the unhappy case, what I can do is that I can do a non-interactive, an instant challenge, where basically somebody exits, and the challenger provides a signature, um, proof that basically the exit is invalid and the coin goes back to the, the deposited state. So the exit cannot settle. In the other unhappy case, there is an interactive challenge. So interactive challenges can happen in the more, let's say, complex uh, challenge situations where Alice exits, somebody makes an interactive challenge, and if Alice does not respond within some predefined time period, the coin goes back to the original, let's say, uh, deposited state. But if everybody, but if all challenges, if the coin like after seven days has zero outstanding challenges and the R here means respond and the IC means interactive challenge, if their all challenges are responding, the coin can get finally settled as normal. Um, so the most like straightforward like type of situation is when Alice has a coin, she spends it to Bob, but then she also tries to exit it. And what Bob must do is because he is the latest owner of the coin, he must let's say go to chain and say that no, Alice spent the coin. So the challenge in this case is show a direct, very explicitly, a direct spend from Alice to Bob. A challenge from Alice to from Bob to Charlie, or uh, yes, it's not valid. It always has to be a direct spend. So even if, Al if Charlie was the latest owner of the coin, he would still have downloaded all the proofs in the history and he would reveal the challenge to Bob. The other case is a double spend. So previously I said that Charlie does not verify the whole coin history. So what happens is that Alice to Bob, Alice to Charlie. So and Charlie is literally Alice. It's a double spend. Um, and so what Bob does is he wants to prove that he is the latest valid owner of the coin. And in order to do that, he literally just reveals a transaction which happened before uh, Charlie's transaction and after Charlie's reference transaction as a parent. And that is, I will claim, sufficient uh, proof um, to basically cancel the challenge, to the exit. And these two are, in, uh, are instant challenges, so they instantly cancel the exit. In the most uh, involved case, uh, this, this attack requires an operator malfeasance. So if you notice here, um, there is no transaction from Alice to Bob. And uh, why is that? It's because the operator, the party who basically defines the state of the plasma chain, says, I don't care, it's Bob's coin. Now you can go to hell. So Alice, if at any time Charlie or Dylan, they try to exit the coin, Alice can do the invalid history challenge. And by invalid history challenge, Alice is attesting that she is the latest owner of the coin. And you may notice that in order to challenge, to respond to this challenge, to this invalid history challenge, somebody must provide, basically, to connect the chain in the history. But if we're in the happy case that Alice is an honest party, um, basically, no, this, this arrow is not possible to exist because she is an honest party and she would never challenge if she knew that there was no uh, response available. Um, 
So now we'll briefly talk about some more general on like layer two scalability that is not being uh, talked a lot lately, I believe. Um, basically, firstly, there's a liveness assumption because somebody must go to chain and challenge, which has borne the requirement for maybe some watchtower services. And also you want the expected reward of an attacker to be less than zero. Because let's say we have a coin that's worth 10,000 ether, you don't want an attacker to be able to consistently spam attack the coin for, I don't know, a year. And until they succeed, because maybe at some point um, the legit owner of the coin will not be online and the attack will succeed. So what we do is usually we attach some sort of uh, fidelity bond that the attacker forfeits each time they get challenged. So firstly, about the liveness requirement, if I start an exit at time zero, there is a finite amount of time until which like, the exit can be finalized. And what happens is that if somebody broadcasts a challenge, the time until the challenge transaction is verified, it must be before the other time. And we can easily see that if some miner or there is some on-chain congestion or whatever, I'm being attacked and I do not, I did not set the fees high enough, if my challenge is included after T0 plus T, my challenge will not be successful. So we need some sort of way to guarantee that there will never be, uh, my challenge will always be included before the T0 plus T. And you do that by making sure that you set like the fees high enough and you set that the, the time until the exit can be finalized is big enough. So the T is a security parameter. And the attacker decision flow, what happens is that I start an exit and there are two scenarios. Either the attack fails because somebody managed to challenge me in the previous case or it doesn't. If the attack doesn't fail, um, I get my security bond back, I get the coin, and I paid some gas fees. Okay, happy case, the attacker goes away, the plasma is broken. Um, if the attacker, though, fails, what the attacker can do as a way to cut his losses is basically try to front run. So the attack is essentially attacker exits, challenger challenges, and then the attacker tries to front run the challenge, they challenge themselves. And by doing that, they basically, if they manage to front run the challenge, they cut their losses because they get their um, security bond back and they can keep attacking. So what we do, alternatively, is that we, that we burn a part of the bond. So if the attacker would get like 10 ether back, like if the security deposit was 10, alternatively, you say they'll get back three ether. So this prevents sort of the front running attack. And we've done some work basically to like make sure that the incentive of the compatibility is less than zero. So this is like an equation to show that. Um, so, so far we showed how we can do fixed denomination payments. So I have five ether coin, I give it to somebody else. I can only give them five ether around. How can we do arbitrary denomination payments? And at this point I want to say that this is not, uh, I have no implementation of that, but this very smart group of fellows I respect has, so you should check it out. Um, so, I have one euro, and this is like my non-fungible token. How do I get fungible tokens? Is that I fragment my one euro in 10, 10 cent fragments. It's literally a range of 10 coins in a line. And uh, basically what we have is that a non-interrupted range, like of 10 coins or 75 coins in a row, can be transferred in one transaction. And it can also be exited in one transaction. But if I do not own the whole range in a row, only one coin in this range is sufficient to cancel my exit, which is very convenient because this means that if I am a party, I do not need to do full, I do not need to verify to hold an arbitrary amount of data. I still have light client validation. I just need to hold enough proof for one element in this whole range to cancel um, a malicious exit for this range. And uh, we can quickly see that like, if I have like two ranges, like I have 0 0.25 and 50 to 100, and Bob has like the gap in between, I can do some defragmentation. And basically we can do an atomic swap between the two like this and now Alice owns directly 0 to 75 and Bob owns 75 to 100. And this is really just an optimization on, the, on uh, like how you do UTXO consolidations to, re to reduce the amount of data that you hold on your clients. And uh, how you do that, uh, this is an, an hour long discussion so I will not get into it, but basically what you want is to have inclusion and exclusion proof for ranges while maintaining light clients. And there, there is a nice video in this uh, talk um, where you can see about how this construction works. The big question now, how can we do this in Bitcoin? Um, firstly, what we want is 
to do metal proof verification. So there is an opcode called opcat, which was removed like a few years ago because there was a sort of a bomb that you could do in the state that you do you did opcat op dupe and you just like start um, blowing up the state. Uh, maybe this could be possible to fix if you limited this, the number of opcats you could do, like say 32 opcats, just to keep the um, to verify 32 uh, length, uh, 32 depth metal tree. I don't know. Um, then you need a state machine because I showed earlier that you have a coin at some states and you need to manage like when it's extable or not. To do state machines, you need covenants, uh, which is a construction that was proposed two years ago, I believe, by Emmanuel Gunsir and others. Um, this requires an opcode called object ob data sig along with opcat. And funnily enough, in an earlier discussion from today, uh, it may be possible to do covenants with opcat and op, um, op sig has no input, which will be getting in the next Bitcoin soft fork, so I'm very excited about it. The other thing we need to do is that I said that the operator is committing Merkle roots to the parent chain. So the problem here is that uh, in Ethereum you can commit arbitrary data and you're fine, you can read it because you have state. Uh, in Bitcoin, you would do that with some op return, so you take some data and you commit the Merkle root. Um, but op returns by default are unspendable UTXOs and full nodes do not hold them. So you cannot rely on the availability of those Merkle roots when you later want to do whatever Merkle proof verification. And so this means that you need some way to have a UTXO that you read inputs that you read its inputs or you read some state uh, in order to basically use that as input to the verification script for the Melkery proofs. That, I do not know anything or any proposal that does it, so if you have any concrete idea on this, please come find me and talk to me about it. So I'll do a very brief summary about what we just talked about. Firstly, we have a non-custodial sidechain via notarization of blocks. And this notarization of blocks, we can also call it a commit chain. So essentially, you take your blocks and you commit them to the parent chain. And there's some interesting work on a similar note called Nocust uh, by the group at Imperial College, so you may want to look at that also. Um, this work has no mass exit vulnerability, which is a feature or problem of the plasma MVP and the more viable plasma constructions, where basically there's a, if if the operator, if the untrusted database manager uh, tries to mess up with the state of the plasma chain, everybody needs to rush to exit. And it can be the case that if the, if the people who need to rush to exit are too many, uh, you essentially have a traffic jam. And you cannot exit in time and somebody will lose their money and that breaks the whole security properties of the system. Um, yeah, you have off-chain gasless payments. Your finality is equal to the parent chain so that um, Basically, like any time you your finality, your transaction finality is equal to whenever the operator commits blocks. So if uh, you commit blocks every 15 seconds, your transactions still settle every 15 seconds, but they cost no gas. And also, you do not have any onboarding costs, so you do not need to open a channel, like in payment channels. The easiest way to think about it is a compression mechanism that you just settle more transactions per block. The main uh, great thing about it is that you must audit only the main chain contract. So there is light client side validation. There is no need to have like the available the full state of the the full state of the chain. You just care about the UTXOs that you and only you own, and everybody else we do not care about them. Um, and the current working pro progress for arbitrary denomination payments, we see that it's possible. Um, for, RS, for even lighter light clients, there was a proposal for RSA accumulators by the Stanford Cryptography Group, which gained a lot of attention, but it doesn't seem like it works for our case because it uses exponentiations, and the number of coins we want to accumulate per block, it can be huge, like because in the fragmentation proposal, you have maybe millions of coins, and you need to do very fast modular exponentiation, and it, it doesn't work. Uh, so maybe you could use a snark, a stark, or some other magic, Maybe there are proposals for this, but still at a very preliminary stage. And uh, finally, we may want to do smart contracts. So I'm a big fan of doing state channels on top of Plasma, which would require um, basically, which are possible with very high probability, like just with a multi-sig and uh, uh, hash and time lock transactions, or a recent construction which essentially provides you customizable exit games per coin per transfer, which will give you more, let's say, flexibility on the spending conditions of your UTXOs. Thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions.
All right. A few questions here. So, so there is a slide about the like challenge transaction inclusion problem. Can you give more explanation on that? So, how to, how could you make sure that the Which challenge one? transaction will be included in layer one when there's congestion congestion in layer one blockchain? You do not. That's yeah, the, this one. Yeah. That's the security assumption. You you set t to be long enough, and that's your security parameter. So, plasma is only as good as its parent chain. So if there is congestion, you better have set the T to be large enough. It is literally the same as in payment channels. You always have some sort of liveness requirement, and you need to make sure that the dispute is included in time. OK. That's common in all layer two protocols. <laughs> OK. Uh, great talk, man. A lot of information condensed into a small amount of time. I was a bit confused about the fragmentation piece. Sure. Um, in the sports Merkle tree, is that like each slot essentially? Cor yeah. In the slot Merkle tree, in the sparse Merkle tree, each leaf slot essentially uh, corresponds to a coin ID of a coin, right? So when you do the fragmentation, how do you arrive at the new coin IDs for the fragmented pieces? Correct. So. Uh, the fragmentation uses a different Merkle tree. The, so the, the plasma cache on its own uses a sparse Merkle tree where coin leaf five literally corresponds to uh, the coin ID with the index five. And the size of the Merkle tree is in the number of coins uh, in the plasma chain. The Merkle index tree, which uh, we were discussing just before the talk, it's uh, the number of uh, you prove inclusion by taking a Merkle proof over a range. So essentially, if you have like, let's say you have like zero to 10, like you prove inclusion by going, by going down the path to zero to 10. And you construct a verifier contract, which probably isn't possible to do on Bitcoin, um, which basically checks certain invariants. So the invariant would be that the end of the range is always less than the start of, the, um, of its neighbor, of its sibling. And the sibling is also less or equal from, the, um, from its uncle, and, and so on. You start building it, and you, you construct a tree which is different from the sparse maple tree, and allows you to prove this. Um, it, it's an involved discussion if you want to do this offline. No, no, no. There is one tree, and they yeah, yeah. 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 What do you mean? Sorry. The, uh, so yeah, like okay. So you have a minimum denomination. Yeah. Um, yeah, you define fragment size 0 0.000, whatever you want to say. And each, let's say, index, so 0 to 75, if the fragment size is 0 0.02, that means the total value transacted is 75 multiplied by 0 0.02. So you need to define the fragment size. And the minimum denomination of your payment is the fragment size. But you say it to be tiny. That's why you call it a fragment. Great. Let's give another round of applause for uh, Georgios. Thank you very much. Really great talk.